Hi folks, and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast. This is session number 317. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew, and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Here we go. Once again, great to have you with me. Looking forward to today's show. Longtime listener, Matt P., was at the November meetup back in London, November 2018, uh, which I held with Damien Fay, my good friend from Money to the Masses. And at the meetup, Matt presented me with two books. First was uh, Human Universe by Professor Brian Cox. And the other was uh, this one. I'm going to hold it up for the camera. Hang on. There we go. This one, Investing Demystified by Lars Croyer. Now, that book is an outstanding work uh, dealing with the subject of investing and the fundamentals of doing so for ordinary people and today thanks to matt uh, and his introduction i get to speak to the man himself lars croyer author of investing demystified so matt thank you so much mate for uh, putting us in touch really appreciate that so uh, that's my what we're going to be doing today. Going to be chatting with Lars. After that, I'll be uh, talking about what we're going to do next time. No reviews today because I'm conscious of time. Don't forget, though, this podcast is brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. Uh, they've been sponsoring me here since 2011, and I'm super grateful to them for doing so. Don't forget also the uh, new Meaningful Money branded self investment platform uh, with Seven IM Meaningful Money TV slash Podcast Invest for that. So. In Investing Demystified, Lars talks about something called the rational portfolio, and I get to ask him what he means by that. Uh, Unsurprisingly, as we go into the conversation, there's lots of behavioral stuff in there, uh, which is kind of the point. And uh, I tell you what, we're just going to get into it. It's just as easy, really. He does a far better job of explaining this stuff than I do. So any notes and links and stuff... They're all at the show notes for this episode, which is MeaningfulMoney.tv slash Session317. MeaningfulMoney.tv slash Session317. Let's just quit rabbiting and get straight into the conversation with Lars. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Lars Croyer to the Meaningful Money podcast. Lars, welcome. How are you doing, sir? Good. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, I'm excited to be on. Yeah, it's great to have you. And this came about because of a mutual friend of ours, uh, Matt Powell. Matt is a listener and to the podcast. Matt came to my uh, meetup in London last November and uh, shared a pint or two with me. And uh, it's been a, it's become a good uh, friend and contact. And he gave me your book, Lars, which is uh, was very kind of him. And I've read it and enjoyed it. And so when he offered us to put us in touch, I bit his hand off. So it's great to have you. Let's kick off, if we can, just with a bit of a bio, you know, who you are, um, you know, where you've come from and how you ended up doing what you're doing now. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm old enough that my bio has gotten pretty long. <laughs> uh, so I'm originally from Denmark, but I haven't lived there since uh, 1990. So that gives you an idea of how old I am. I lived in the US for, for 10 years where I did all my uh, university and I worked on Wall Street at an investment bank. Um, then after university, I went and joined a hedge fund in New York, but very soon after moved to uh, to London, join another hedge fund, and um, and in 2002 I set up my own fund. So did that uh, for a while until incredibly fortuitously in early 08 I returned capital to the external investors and um, essentially continued with my own money. Okay. Uh, since then I uh, I still sit on the board of uh, a number of hedge funds and um, well you know about one of them but I've written a couple of books about finance. Yes. Um, and so that's that's really my background in this field. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm going to come back to the hedge fund thing later. It's um, you know the the book specifically that Matt uh, gave me. And yes, there. Are, what's the other one called? This one is Investing Demystified. What's the yes, other book the, called? The, one, the, the first. So, so I've written two full, and then part of a third. I'm a, I'm a part of a third one. But um, the first one is called Money Mavericks, that's and right. it's essentially a book um, that describes my journey and. As starting and running a hedge fund, how that came about, and all the the defeats and the victories, and um, really trying to uh, yeah explain what what that world was. And I always felt that 
um, not to bore your listener with another topic, but I always felt that um, the hedge fund world was a misunderstood one. Oh, that most of the literature out there was about, you know, the, the Bernie Madoffs of the world that had you know, cheated people out of billions or about George Soros that had made billions typically at the expense of someone else all while flying private jets and driving Ferraris. Mm. And, and I felt that that was not the world I'd been a part of, but also that that world was not unexciting, that yeah. it was a tremendously interesting world. And so I felt I could, um, I had a pretty unique opportunity to write a book in the first person saying, well, what, what was it like being me? Mm. And we did, um, we did very well, but we started, um, had very humble beginnings. So, which is funny because I I've later learned that that's the best bit of the book that people like the most is when we were doing really shit and, <laughs> and we're being humbled on a daily basis. That's much more fun than the good stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but, so it says something about human psyche, doesn't it? That, yeah, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, if, you know, a hedge fund manager from a good family, so no one's ever going to feel too sorry for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tell me about investing demystified. What was the what was the trigger for this? Why did you feel like you wanted or had to write it? Yeah. So, so the, well, the, the 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 very practical trigger was that the first book ended up doing really well, mm-hmm. and so my publisher um, came back, Financial Times, came back and said, you know, we'd like you to write another book. And, and I didn't want to be like the hedge fund guy. I didn't think that was, but you know, I didn't want to write an, another version of the first one. And so um, the topic in the second book is actually something that's throughout my adult life been very close to my heart. And, um, and I thought, well, just because I ran a hedge fund is not in any way inconsistent with the message of the second book. And so it's actually originally, I, I thought of, instead of going into, um, investment banking, I thought of getting a PhD and teaching this stuff. So that was actually my, but then I had a ton of debt and they offered a lot of money. And so I sold my soul. But but I, you know, I've always felt that, you know, the idea of investing and knowing whether you can beat the market or not, and what you should do as a consequence of not being able to beat the market is not only a theoretically very interesting topic but it's actually one with extraordinarily far-reaching practical implications and i thought here i had you know the the knowledge and i had the background and you know the platform i had a publisher who wanted to let me write a book right so so i thought that was pretty pretty cool actually it was pretty unique opportunity and no one directed me to you know what i should and shouldn't write so Excellent. So that's how it came about. In Free fact, reign. It's funny to have to explain the publisher back in the day how it was different from some of the other, call it index-oriented books, because it is different. I can talk to that. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I would like you to talk to that because yeah, you you mentioned there that the approach to investing that you talk about in investing demystified it was not sort of incompatible. I can't remember the exact word you just used with mm-hmm. your background as a hedge fund manager, which is obviously a very mm-hmm. different kind of approach. So how mm-hmm. do you go from one to the other? And yeah, if you can just speak into the, it's not really a transition because you say they're, they're sort of. Right. Yeah. No, I often get accused of being a hypocrite. So it's oh, a, no. I'm not calling you that. <laughs> right. You know, what is it they say? A double standard is twice as good as a standard. <laughs> <laughs> no, but look, okay. So I think, where should you start, right? Where you should start by who are you? And um, you should start by making it clear in your own head whether you can outperform the markets or not. Can you beat the markets, right? Now, because you can or cannot, doesn't mean that markets can or cannot. It's a huge leap, right? So I often think of my mom, which is a little unfair, right? Can my mom outperform the many, many brilliant investors I've come across in my time that all have better access to information, to management, to technology, to even all the accounting stuff Mm -hmm. and time, you know, they do it for a living. And the answer is she doesn't have a shot in hell. (laughs) So, so let's accept that. And I go through in the book, like, cause I've been on the other side of that. What is it actually that all these investors do and know and, have insights into before they buy or sell a share. And it's an awful lot of work and some of it extremely intricate. And even then, it's not always clear that they can beat the markets. So compare that to someone sitting in their boxer shorts in front of one of these you know, E-Trade accounts. It's just, it's just not an even match. So that's point one. Just because you cannot doesn't mean that markets cannot. 
So when I was running a hedge fund, I was very much of the view that we could. You know, we had the best minds and finance working with us. Uh, we had fantastic investors. We had fantastic uh, access to information and technology. And management teams wanted to talk to us and engage with us and even sometimes listen to us. <laughs> Not always, but sometimes. And so if we couldn't beat the markets, what chances, um, what are the chances my mom can? You know, nil. Well, she might, but it would be luck. Right? You never want to depend on them. So that's point one. Point two is then, well, shouldn't my mom just give um, her money to someone like me or some version of me? And there are thousands, Lars, many more. But there are many, many Larses out there, you know, guys wearing khaki pants and a nice tie. <laughs> and so you've got to look at the statistics and say, let's, let's ignore hedge funds for a second because that's a little more intricate who can and can invest, cannot invest in this. But let's say mutual funds, so the ones you see advertisements on on the high street, right? uh, fidelity of the world. And things have changed a little bit, but if you take it from a statistical perspective and say, let's say you buy access to the, the FTSE through one of these mutual funds. And statistically speaking, historically, the chances that that one mutual fund outperforms the index that is trying to outperform over a 10-year period is about 10 to 15%, give or take. Who knows? And you can always find statistics saying whatever you want it to say. Mm -hmm. So call it one in 10. Well, call it one in five to be extraordinarily generous. <laughs> well, then the next question is, my mom would have to ask herself is, okay, so I know I can't find out better than the world if Facebook is going to go up or down in value. But I also have to pick the one out of five investment professionals that all look good and they all went to the right schools and they all work at the right places and they all have the right teams and the great ads and great track record. And I have to pick one out of five of those in order for it to beat the market or beat the index. Those are not great Even, odds. <laughs> that's terrible, right? Mm. So again, so you can beat the market by individual stock selection. We can talk about other security classes, by the way. Now we're sort of talking equities, but it applies broadly. Um, so you can't beat the individual stock selection and you can't beat the market by manager selection, i.e. which, you know, which of the better looking cocky dressed uh, <laughs> dudes also. And so, so don't. Now, so then the next question my mom sits back with is, should you invest? I, I've now learned that I know nothing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and the answer to that is absolutely you should, because if you don't invest, what are you going to do with your money? Put them in the bank and earn 0%? What? I mean, that's a choice, right? Yeah. And sometimes you should do that. But historically, and there are no predictors of future um, performance of equity markets. If anyone tells you otherwise, they, mm -hmm. they're, they're wrong. Um, but if you take this sort of, slightly academic approach and you say, well, historically across all markets, also the one that went bust and also the one that went well over the last, call it two, three, two, 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 two fifty hundred years of, um, of history, mm -hmm. equity markets have returned somewhere around four to 5% above inflation. So if you start by saying, well, for a similar risk, it's not unreasonable that you can expect a similar return. So, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> and anyone will tell you equity markets can go anywhere, and they really can. Mm -hmm. But if you say that for a similar risk to the one you endured in the past, you can expect a similar return. That's not insane. And, and that's 4 to 5% for historical equity market risks. Mm -hmm. And that's why you should invest, because that you can reasonably hope, but with huge variability. I'm talking too much. No, no, not at all. That's why you're here, mate. That's absolutely fine. It's, it's, a, it's an absolute delight to listen to you. Um, I mean, I, I absolutely resonate, obviously, with everything you said. It's, um, uh, it's what I sort of preach to my limited ex, uh, extent. I don't have anything like your level of uh, experience or expertise in, in the area. But as a financial planner, I'm not an investment manager. But unlike a lot of financial advisors, I know I'm not an investment manager, right? <laughs> a lot of them. Well, honestly, that, I think that's the way the industry is heading. Yeah, me too. Because just because you can't beat the markets doesn't mean you're not adding a lot of value. Mm. In fact, I, got an e I get emails every day from readers, and they're very often of the variety. I have X pounds, dollars, mm -hmm. euros, krona, whatever. Well, can you help me invest it? And I'm always like, that's, that's not what I do. But if you believe the message that I'm writing, 
at least you know what to invest in. Yes. That doesn't mean I can help you with taxes or estate planning or even like someone to help you through tough times. Yeah. Or how do you think about the interaction between your job, your house, your, you know, the jurisdiction you live in, all that stuff. You, I think there's a lot of room for financial planners. Yeah. And it, but it becomes a different role once you're not in the position to say, oh, you should buy Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, if you were to sort of summarize, you call your um, you call your the portfolio uh, sort of a makeup that you talk about in the book. You call it the rational. Right, very unexciting. Huh? Yeah, well, no, <laughs> but it's uh, it's evocative. So, I, can you just speak to that? What you mean by that, and essentially mm. how you construct a rational portfolio? Yeah. Um, so the term the rational it's it's a bit of a grandiose term. Really, I accept that. It's the idea that once you get past the acceptance and embracing of the fact that you can't beat the markets, this is the rational thing to do. Okay. That's what it is. Okay. Um, so what is the rational thing to do? Um, well, let's, let's start with equity markets and then we'll go from there. So I'm saying you can't beat the markets. So what does that mean? It means you can't pick which stocks are going to go up or down relative to the market. But as we talked about earlier, you should invest in the markets mm. because you're hoping to get a 4 or 5% annual return above inflation with big risk. Okay. So what is the market? Well, there's a temptation, you know, we're both in the UK right now. So there's a temptation to say, well, that's the UK. But there are actually very good reasons not to invest in the UK, or certainly not only to invest in the UK. So let's compare the UK market to the Brazilian market or the US market or the Australian market. There's no reason to think that the UK market, that you as an investor who's accepted, you can't beat the market. There's no reason to think that you know better or worse whether the UK market will do better or worse than any of those other countries I just mentioned. In fact, if you had that knowledge, that would be extraordinarily valuable knowledge. <laughs> um, go get rich if you do. <laughs> in everything I say, there's sort of the, you know, go get rich if you think I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, don't forget us little people when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I think there's a, uh, so what you should do is you should diversify as broadly as you possibly can to avoid taking individual country risk, individual jurisdiction risk. And you should certainly, if you do, if you only do one market, don't do your own because that market is typically correlated to all your other assets, your job, your education, your house, anything ties back to the local economy. And so what I'm saying is for equities, you can actually just buy one product. And that one product is a global stock index. So there are, there are many variations of it, many providers, including Vanguard and BlackRock, and uh, one is called MSCI One Index, and Vanguard had their own. But they're all very, very similar. And what they're trying to do is to give you the broadest, cheapest exposure you can get. So buy a global tracker. Every stock in the world, theoretically speaking, we can go into details of why it doesn't work that way, but close enough, right? Mm-hmm. So now for your equity portion, think of it as if you have an index that covers the global stock market in the proportions to the value of that market. So in other words, the most valuable company today, I don't know what it's, the Apple or Amazon or something like that, um, has a greater proportion than some small company in, in, uh, in, you know, in, or anyway, in the U.S. Um, because it's a bigger part of that index, which makes sense because what you're saying when you're saying you can't beat the market is you're saying, I'm assuming that every dollar invested in the market is equally clever and that I'm not more clever than any one of those dollars. Mm. So if the, if the market is saying that Microsoft is worth 100 and a small stock is worth two, well, those $2 and those $100 are equally clever, or I'm not cleverer than either. of them. And so therefore, I should own $100 worth of one and $2 worth of the other. That's what I'm, I'm, it's called a market cap weighted yeah. index. Mm-hmm. So for equities, that's what you should do. Just do that. Make sure you do it cheap. Make sure you tax optimize, and that's where you come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that means something different to different people. And I, I, I don't really get involved with that because it's so, you know, it's unique to the individual. Think about liquidity, although these are extraordinarily liquid products. Um, But now, so now that's equities. You're done. You are done. If you invest in equities, that's all you need in my view. 
Um, and I've yet to have anyone convince me of otherwise. And a lot of people are trying. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Um, and so, um, okay, so there, there's some nuances around there we can come back to. But, they, but, but, but that, if you do that, in my view, you're doing better than anyone you know, mm. okay? Assuming that you don't think you can beat the market. So now you have a portfolio of, say, let's say 100, and it's invested in equities. You now know what to do. But what if the risk of the equity markets is not your risk profile? Mm -hmm. Now, your risk profile is a very, very individual thing, right? If you're down to your last thousand pounds and you're about to retire, well, don't take a lot of risk. Or the, the, the terrible analogy I use is, you know, if you, if you have a, a hundred pounds and you need 95 for a heart surgery next year, then don't invest in equity markets <laughs> because you might on average do better, but you know, you can also go horribly wrong. Mm. Um, so you now have your equity portfolio, but it's not clear that that's all you should invest in. In fact, very often it's not. So how do you can combine that with something that um, gives you the kind of risk that you need? So now we're in the UK as a great example because the UK actually has a super low risk alternative, namely the UK government bonds. Mm -hmm. Okay, not every currency has that, but your currency and mine, well, not mine, but your currency <laughs> will have that. Um, and, and so let's say you, your investment horizon is 10 years. Well, you can buy a 10 year government bond or you can buy uh, ETFs that does that for you. Um, and you can combine that so let's, with, the, with the equity investment. So let's say your risk profile is such that for half your portfolio, you want to take no risk, and for the other half, you could take equity risk. Well, you buy 50-50. So imagine like you have super low risk, but also no return, and super high risk, but also high returns. And how much you should invest of the two of them depends on you. If you're very risk-loving, do a lot of equity. If you're very risk-averse, do a lot of the bond. Mm -hmm. And you have two products here. That's it. Nice and simple. You're done. You are done. And, 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 and you can add complexity around this corporate bonds. Um, sure. But it doesn't add as much as you think. You can add other government bonds and say, well, I don't believe in the credit world in the UK. Sure. But then you start taking currency risk. Mm -hmm. right? That's why you know, a lot of people use US bonds, but you're taking dollar risk. Mm -hmm. And not at, uh, necessarily at a better credit rating either. But, but this portfolio I'm talking about is stunningly simple. Mm -hmm. right? You have two products and you're done. Think mm. about your risk, think about your tax, but you're done. Mm. And that's it. If you had another currency, let's say you, we were having this conversation in Brazil, you would have be forced to make the choice of, do you want to take credit risk with the Brazilian government? Mm currency risk with a risk called risk-free um, investment in something like UK, Euro, German government bonds, or US, AAA rated government bonds. But you take, you take currency. currency risk. So how come then, uh, with the equity side, you're getting the diversification by tracking global markets, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Why not do that on the bond side? Why not uh, be a little bit more diversified that I, I, I hesitate to use the word conventional wisdom because very often that's a tautology right not tautology um uh, oxymoron <laughs> that's generally con convention is not wise very often right yeah. but you know conventional but wisdom might be to diversify the bond bit as well yeah. so i'm just interested well, on your view on that and why well no you certainly i mean look what are you trying to do with a bond portfolio you're trying to not lose money that's the question isn't it yeah what is it for is it yeah. just a volatility dilution yeah, thing? I mean, you could, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you're a great, and, and you could make an argument, but you're making the portfolio very complex mm -hmm. because it's also not easy to buy a lot of these products. If I told you now, go buy government bonds from Brazil, Mexico, and <laughs> Vietnam, you'd be like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, how do I do that exactly? <laughs> and, and, and tell me this, in which proportions? Yeah. In the proportions that they're issued? in the proportion of the indebtedness of those countries, in the proportion of the GDPs. So you can see all of a sudden you're like a bond investor. Okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and then, so you know, I'm not, you, you just, it's the same argument with corporate bonds. You can go that route. And if you very quickly, 
deliberately or inadvertently end up back at having claimed that you know something the world doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Or you're adding a ton of complexity or implicitly both. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's so why I'm saying 95, you know, you can, you know, if, if you and I were together running the world's largest pension fund, yeah, you, you should probably do more stuff than these two simple products I'm describing. Yeah. Right. But I, I would say for 95% of um, retail and even wholesale investors, mind you, they're big pension funds that are doing just this. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, two of the biggest savings people never think about is one, it's actually time. Mm. Right? So when I get emails from people, about half the time, they're like, wow, I didn't realize like where all this time came from. I used to stress <laughs> so much about with stocks and I used to buy the Financial Times and religiously read about quarterly results. And now I just, I just know I, can, I have this index and it might go down, mm. but at least I'm not spending the time. And on average, I will probably do better. Mm. And so, so the time component is a huge one. But the biggest one is the cost component. And in the book, I use an example, and it, it's, it's sort of from real life, actually. But if you take the scenario of someone who starts working as a, driving a train in the London Underground, and from the ages of 25 until, I forget, I think it's 67, and that he or she makes 50000 a year on average, and that that goes up by inflation. And let's say, and ignore tax, which you certainly shouldn't, but let's <laughs> ignore tax for a second. But um, let's say that, that person puts 10% of the in annual income aside in equities mm -hmm. and every year and, and, and that his or her salary goes up with inflation. At retirement, let's say two scenarios. One invested in a regular mutual fund that try to pick the market with all the fees and expenses and marketing associated with that and the other invested in an index track. And let's just say that before fees, this mutual fund did like the market, which is sort of what you'd expect. And let's just say that equity markets did like they have in the past, no better or worse. Right? So I think I use four and a half percent, but don't hold me to that. The difference in savings at retirement. So part one, mutual fund, part two, an index tracker is the equivalent of six Porsche cars. <laughs> so this is a, someone driving the train on the London underground throughout his career who could never afford a Porsche car has paid over his lifetime or her lifetime, the equivalent of six Porsche cars mm -hmm. in fees and expenses. Yeah. That's, that's there better really be a good wrong. reason for that. Right. There yeah. better be a good reason for that. So that just puts like, this is not a small topic. No, a big topic. absolutely yeah. right. Uh, yeah, you, you, you're you're dead right, and it's um. I think there's a real squeeze on costs now, which is healthy. I think regulators, you know, at all levels, whether it's you know, asset managers or uh, platform admin system providers or financial advisors, and and there is a squeeze, and that can only be in, in investors' best interest, which is good. <laughs> just want to sort of stay on the bond thing, just because I get I get this sort of spoken at me by investment managers all the time um, in the sort of uh, commentary that, you know, we've had, quotes, a 30-year bull run in bonds, in bond prices, and there's no value in bonds. Mm. It's really hard to find value. I would just wonder what you sort of would say to that, given that we're, that's a minimal risk asset you're saying is, is government bonds ideally in your own jurisdiction if it's good, um, if there's so sort of good credit risk there. Mm. Um, you know, are, is it, not possible that we're buying a loss there or are we actually talking about buying individual bonds at par or, or, or what? You can just sort of speak a little yeah, bit to that. I mean, keep in mind in all of this, um, I've actually never said that I think I know which way the markets are going. No, no, any, that's true. Uh, right. And, and that's a key premise because otherwise I'm, I'm breaking my own premise. Yeah. So, you know, what, let's say you're buying a 10 year bond. And let's say interest rates go up, right? real interest rates go up, the value of that bond will go down, of course mm -hmm. it will. But let's you know, consider the alternatives. What are you going to do with that money that you want to take no risk with? Mm. What do you want to do with it? Are you going to put it under your bed? Are you going to buy gold, which, by the way, is extraordinarily volatile? Mm, exactly. Are you going to buy property? Well, 
you're probably, well, I don't know you, but most people are massively over-invested in property, which again, by the way, correlates with your job, your economy, et mm -hmm. cetera, et cetera. Most people are massively invested in property. Don't go buy more, certainly not down the street from where you live. You're adding to correlation. Mm -hmm. And in the UK, there's a tendency to think that's a great idea because it's work. But go ask people in Florida or Las Vegas how to work for them. <laughs> yeah, and sure. Correlation risk is one of the most underappreciated risks in the financial uh, mm -hmm. sector. But so I'm not saying that you know it's minimal risk. It's not no risk. Why is it minimal risk? Because if you buy, let's say, a zero coupon 10-year bond, and it's going to give you 110 years, let's even somehow manage inflation adjust it. Mm -hmm. Then you know that in 10 years, you will get 100. Mm -hmm. That's all you know, right? Will, will it in the meantime, interest rate mean that bond goes up or down in value? Maybe. But you know, I mean, the shorter date the bonds, the less interest rate will impact yes. the value of the bonds. Right? Exactly. But but maybe also turn it on and said all those guys that come and say you're buying at the peak yeah. of, of the bond market well well go short it and make money <laughs> exactly right? I mean, yeah yeah they, they, they've no idea whether we're at the top of the market or well, not no, they, none I, of us I, do yeah i don't know the people so i, I certainly don't know right but yeah they're, you know i think it's been five years now that i've heard of hedge funds shorting japanese government bonds because they can certainly only go down and and all that's happened is they're now five years older. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, again, it's like it's a pretty big statement. I mean, the, the global government bond market is a multi trillion dollar market filled with really well informed economists all over the world buying and selling all day. Mm -hmm. And someone makes a throwaway comment that it's reached the peak. Mm -hmm. Pretty bold statement. It is. And I certainly not one I would advise my mom to make. <laughs> yeah no exactly it's so easy to throw away this stuff i'm thinking you know i'm already second guessing myself i'm, I'm sure i've said that i may even have said that on the podcast that's really bad so I'm, i re, i uh, sort of resolve now to be more careful about what i say in future. another thing that happens is we all tend to remember our victories right yeah sure. we all tend to remember when we were right and i actually think a huge problem in investing is if let's say you go to a dinner party tonight and you're sitting around the table and you made money in google mm. you know some people would love to tell that story because it has all this sort of, oh, I'm so smart. I'm so insightful. I'm so full of this. I'm an investor. I have money. All of that. <laughs> and maybe they're just lucky. Yeah. Right? yeah. Who knows? Maybe they're just lucky. They certainly don't think so because people who make money in the stock markets never think they're lucky, right? Otherwise, exactly. they should do what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, let's say there's a person sitting next to that person who had done exactly the same betting on horses. Most people around the table would go like, ooh, that's not. You know, you shouldn't bet on horses. You, you're going to lose money, right? <laughs> so there's this in investing, there's this sort of, you know, oh, you're a player. You're, you're smart. You're astute. You're good with money, right? And so, therefore, there's the conventional wisdom certainly encourages us to have an opinion. And I'm saying don't have an opinion, except you don't, which I guess it is an opinion in itself. But, <laughs> um, but so it's, it can be hard, which I actually sometimes think it's, it's almost an emotional argument that you have to believe like, that it's okay. You have to believe that you're actually more informed by accepting you know, where you should and shouldn't play. So uh, you mentioned the word emotion. So that's a behavior thing. So I mean, behavioral finance, behavioral economics is a subject that fascinates me. Long-time listeners of the show know that. I've dealt with it in and out now and again. My good friend Andy Hart of uh, Maven Money, he's uh, a real sort of zealot for behavioral finance and, and speaks mm. a lot into that. Mm. I wonder what your experience of that is, as somebody who has invested other people's money as well as your mm. own. Um, mm. Mistakes people have made and, uh, you know, what people can do perhaps to improve their chances, uh, you know, of, um, or, or rather reduce the chances of falling foul to, of, to bad behavior. Mm. Well, I would say... It's, it's a huge tendency to, you know, say, read something in The Economist or the FT or somewhere and go trade, go do something. Because mm. it even feels good to do something. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and there's a, you know, it, this day and age, it doesn't cost a lot to trade, right? So it seems cheap. Mm. Um, but a lot of people that do that would over time do significantly worse. Right? They will just... Forgetting the time that it takes, but there are tax implications, there are bid offer spreads, 
very often on, on the platforms, you certainly don't get very good execution. There is commission. Mm. Um, and I think the, the – so don't do that. <laughs> don't. Just Stop leave it. it alone. Don't yeah. think because X has happened in the market, you know the market better. Mm. You know, there's also a tendency like markets have done so well, so they will continue to go up. That actually happens professionally too. If investors that have done so well will clearly do better. Mm. Or – you know, people panicking at the bottom and saying, oh, it's going to all go to hell now. Right? Um, so th- stay consistent in your belief that you can't beat the market, even after X has happened. Mm. The other thing I think is Im- important is that just because, well, all right, so let me take a step back. So what can happen that makes sense is you can change your risk profile. You know, let's say that, you invested all in equities, and this is a terrible example that I hope should happen to no one, but that you, that you don't think very hard about your risk. And let's say you invest in 100 in equities, and equity market's hot. Mm. You might think, shit, I was greedy. I cannot afford for this to fall anymore. Because then I'd have to also, let's just say, all sorts of bad things are going to happen in your life. You might actually find yourself forced to sell at a huge loss. Mm. Not because you think markets are going to fall any further, because you accept that you don't know that and markets can bounce back. Um, but because you simply, your circumstances are such that you're a forced seller. Mm. And that, unfortunately, is something that happens a lot in, in down markets, right? And, um, you, know, uh, you know, some people double down, but that's a bit like going to casino. Mm. You, know, you know, that game where you play on red and it comes up black, you double the amount you play on red. That game actually really works until it really, really doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what doubling down in the market is like, right? So, so I think um, you know, to be, be, be very aware of that. Mm. And I do think, but it's a pet thing of mine. No, no one ever listens to me. That's true very often, by the way. But <laughs> I think people don't think enough about correlation risk. And what I mean by correlation risk is um, – I forget the example I have in my book, but it was a person, it was a real person actually, who was living in London. She worked in real estate. She was a real estate broker, had most of her money in a London house mm. and was going to inherit her parents' place. That was also a London property, a lot, lot of mortgage. And then had some savings um, and had a certificate, uh, an education in this space. Um, in London and was working for her London firm and had some insurance policies that were also very local. And, um, and then the savings she had, she wanted to invite, invest it in London property uh, stocks. <laughs> so she's extremely long London, <laughs> right? This is before Brexit and all that stuff. But like, that, that's just don't, right? <laughs> I mean, if London does well, she'll be fine. Right. If London does crap, she's all the things go pear shaped at the same time for the same reason. Mm. That's correlation risk. Mm. And there are all sorts of ways that manifest itself. And it's actually more and more important as the world has gotten more interlinked. Yeah. I, and, one uh, example I come across quite often is people who own shares in the company they work for. So the work share safe schemes, you know, I had one client who had 180,000 pounds worth of cable and wireless shares. He'd worked for them all his life, all around the world. And, uh, they went down to eight. And this, you know, and, you know, know, and, 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 and sometimes people don't have a choice no, sure. or the tax advantages are so huge that, yeah. you know, yeah, there's reasons. That's yeah. one thing. The other thing is think a little bit about, um, you know, your pension, who guarantees it. Is it are there sort of correlation risks like the ones you talk about there? Mm-hmm. Um, very often there aren't in the UK, but elsewhere that's a real issue mm-hmm. because it's guaranteed by the government. Just like you don't worry about deposits in your bank. And the reason it's not really a topic of conversation is because it's guaranteed by the government. Mm-hmm. But there are places where these are real issues. Yeah, sure. um, and uh, so there are these things that I think people don't think about enough. But I'd more say the central theme to my book, if I could just make people think a little bit more about whether they can beat the markets or not. I would. Mm. That's definitely the uh, prevailing A lot message. of the other stuff will follow. Yeah, right? for sure. I, and, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned ETFs a couple of times. Most folks listening to this will know what that is. That's exchange-traded mm-hmm. fund. Um, I wondered, 
you know, ETF versus like just a tracker oik and why one or the other? I, I'm completely agnostic. I okay. I wonder I, whether you had strong views on that. Yeah, no, I, like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get the cheapest, broadest exposure. Okay. That's tax efficient for you. ETFs are, are, are easy because you can buy and sell them like a, a regular stock. Mm. And, and through that, you're buying and selling the underlying. In the old days, there were index funds. Um, mm. And they were, I mean, it, you don't actually have to go that far back. Before, and still in some countries, there are no real indices. There are no index trackers. Mm. So keep in mind, the difference between an index and an index tracker is like, we can all agree what the FTSE is. But how do you go buy the FTSE? Someone has to create something you can actually go buy. Right? Yeah. You know, that actually used to be a bigger deal. And then in some countries, they might have an index, but there are all sorts of restrictions on buying securities in that country. So you can't actually go buy it. And good luck buying securities in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and, and, and so it's not, you know, these access products are, um, ECFs have grown tremendously just because it's so easy. They're easy to create. Um, they're, they're easy to buy and sell. Yeah. Um, you know, theoretically, if you had tons of money, you could create your own index. Mm. You know, think of it, what is an index? It's like you and I right now can decide to create an index of companies that have a CEO named Bob. That's an index. <laughs> yeah. That is an index. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, but it's an index. Yeah, sure. And, and um, but, but so, you know, it's clear that that uh, you know the access product is is what's important here. Yeah, it's just a great thing. There's a reason they've grown a lot. Yeah, sure. I know. See this uh, difference between physical and synthetic in the book. You're you're fairly ag yeah. agnostic about that as well. Really. Yeah, I think the world has gone physical. Yeah. Why is that, do you think? Is it just uh, because the, the, there's a sort of sense of security? I, I should just mention, th this is a little bit the deep end of the pool, but a, uh, a physical ETF will own the physical assets uh, underneath a given index. So if it's FTSE 100 ETF, it will actually own FTSE 100 shares, yeah, but a synthetic will come up with another way of tracking the market. So that's a fair yeah. summary? Right, yeah. Now, the reason I think it's a simple one is... Um, I'm, I'm, I've started a charity and I was, I was in a meeting in this sort of complete aside mm -hmm. and with an, uh, a Kenyan based reinsurance company and they had some money to invest. And I said, go buy these ETFs. And I explained the difference between physical and synthetic. And the guy running it said, wait a minute. So you want me to go back and tell my board that, I own something that I don't really own, but it's backed by collateral that may not be related. Wait, what? <laughs> like, nope, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Physical it is, yeah. Simple. Physical it is. Stop talking, right? And so <laughs> I was like, okay. And I'm like, if I was struggling to explain it to him, then, then so I think maybe, I mean, I'm sure the guy selling you synthetic can come up with a better explanation. Sure. Than, yeah. But, but it just sort of feels right. Yeah. You know, you buy something and that something owns what it says it owns. Yeah. Yeah. Th there's a lot to be said for that. I think a lot of the, the ills in the financial services world is uh, stuff being opaque, you know, yeah. and people getting involved in stuff they don't fully understand and, and being sold to. So <laughs> you can say that again. Yeah. <laughs> That's the understatement of the day, right? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Look, Lars, this has been a joy. I've uh, really enjoyed talking to you. I would, uh, we could go on and on and on, but I'm uh, conscious of your time and uh, of the listeners. But obviously, the book is highly recommended, Investing Demystified uh, and Money Mavericks as well. That, I haven't read that one yet, but I, uh, no, that's, I'll send that's, you that's now on my list. And um, so where can folks find out more about you and what you're doing? Well, if you, if you know how it well, works, I don't know what I'm doing is that interesting, but uh, um, if you know how to spell my surname, um, I, the publisher, this, this is actually a funny story. The publisher asked me to put together some videos explaining what I do. Yeah. And it was that simple. It's actually on the laptop. I'm now doing this thing with, and so I put some videos up on YouTube explaining these concepts and they've gotten a ton of views. So mm -hmm. if you know how to spell my, my, my surname, just bang that into YouTube and, and, yeah. uh, and there are a bunch of videos. Um, I also have a website, which is croya.com. Um, 
I'll um, make sure there's a link to I don't that. Really sell anything? That's what no, 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 no. Absolutely. Yeah, but, no, but uh, I've watched those videos and they're super helpful. So I'm, I'll make sure there's links to uh, to all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, I tell you, it's actually I, I built this financial spreadsheet. It was kind of funny because I just built it as I was talking into the computer and it's been viewed a ton. And mm. it's in Excel. I'm a huge Excel nerd from my investment banking days. But you know, and if people have suggestions for what else, um, I'm totally open. I kind of I do this as a hobby. It's it's yeah. interesting. Fun. I love the feedback. Um, right. it, it's sort of keep in mind. It's not often that you're a, someone with a hedge fund background. And you feel you get to make a meaningful improvement in people's lives, and it feels really good. Actually, I will it, say that. it really does. Yeah, I uh, I feel the same. Lars, thank you so much for your time, sir. It's been a joy speaking to you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Lars is great. I could have talked to him all day. <laughs> Clearly very knowledgeable, wonderful sense of humor, um, but a real passion as well for helping folks put their money in order and invest intelligently, rationally, I should say. Um, I'm not sure whether we actually sort of named it in the, con the conversation. In the book, Lars talks about having an edge, or actually he talks about not having an edge. In the conversation, he uh, he covered it by saying that we, we need to understand that we will never beat the market. We don't have an edge. And I think that's the biggest single message uh, from Lars. Don't believe you have an edge. You don't. So just buy the world instead. Just do the world tracker. Um, uh, dilute it a little bit or um, account for your own risk profile by holding uh, government bonds and just read the book it's absolutely outstanding there's a link to the book in the show notes um, so meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 317 my thanks again to Lars for coming on and to Matt for introducing us um, I get the feeling we'll be hearing from Lars again <laughs> So next time, I'm going to be uh, introducing you to the second member of my team here at Meaningful Money, a gentleman named Kawayan Silev. Now, you might remember that I spoke with a lady called Gudrun Lorette back in uh, Season 12, Episode 3. Gudrun is my writer, so she takes the podcast scripts, uh, makes lots of other content from them. Well, Cal is my marketing genius. He really gets it. When I first met with Cal for an exploratory call, you know, we read the same stuff, we follow the same people online. There was an immediate connection and I knew he was going to really be able to help me and he has. So he's the one responsible for the Facebook group, MeaningfulMoney.tv slash community. Uh, the new Meaningful Money Instagram account, which is only going to go from strength to strength as we go forward. And uh, all the social media stuff, the strategy and the execution of it, he's doing. Uh, and it's really improving the reach of the show. So I'm super grateful to Cal for helping me with that. And he and I are going to talk next week for you to listen a little bit about where we're going over the coming year, including season 14, which will start the following week and which we'll, we'll talk about that next week and sort of introduce it a little bit. Um, Meaningful Academy, which is a massive piece of work, but uh, still in the works, but will be open for business very soon. So uh, looking forward to that. Me and Carrie Ann next week having a, a good chat about the future of uh, Meaningful Money and all that he's bringing to the party. So look forward to that. And that's it for today's episode. So I hope you enjoyed it. Listen back again. Uh, read Lars's book. Links to it all at the show notes. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 317. Hope you enjoyed it, folks. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time. Okay.